I have told Miss Bennet several times that she will never play really well unless she practices more. And though Mrs. Collins has no instrument, she is very welcome, as I have often told her, to come to Rosings every day and play on the pianoforte in Mrs. Jenkinson's room. She would be in nobody's way, you know, in that part of the house. From Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Published 1813 This story is a fiction based on facts. Written by Mia Rice. Jane's Pianoforte The final inventory of the household furniture had now been completed. The auction of material goods of the Steventon Rectory, where Jane Austen grew up and discovered her love of writing, would soon take place. Parting with them was inevitable. Her papa's globe and microscope used to instruct schoolboys in preparation for Oxford, 200 volumes of books that every Austen in the household devoured, chest drawers, bureaus, and many more were up for the taking. But it was the pianoforte that Jane had the trepidation of losing, the pianoforte that would be foremost in her mind when she would write about merry music making. The Austin's particular pianoforte was crafted by one Christopher Gaynor, the German piano maker with a shop in Soho. It was rectangular with 54 keys and its timbre sounded more like the harpsichord. Not all the Austins were inclined to music, but Jane was intimate with the keys of the pianoforte during the early mornings before everyone awoke. This musical invention that played whimsical pieces from composers such as Eichner, Pleyel and Kramer brought entertainment into their home. Among all the items to be auctioned off, Jane would pine for this instrument most of all. Naturally, everything here was dear to Jane. But what choice did she have? Now in her upper twenties, neither her sister Cassandra nor herself have made a good match. With her eldest brother James ready to take on the reins of the parish, and her papa's health now on a decline, they had to move to Bath with barely anything in tow. Many items would have to go, and not even their cherished four-posted beds, nor the dainty dimity that had doubtfully hung on them could be saved. They would rent a house in Bath, and her papa's salary as a clergyman would sustain a practical way of living. But life would not be like in this parsonage, which she preferred. Taking one last glance at their possessions, Jean found herself at the mahogany library table. Here, sometimes, she wrote her early satires and plays. Here, her father wrote many of his sermons. And here, she completed her yet-to-be-published epistolary novel, Lady Susan. Not long after, the rustling of footsteps and the sound of carriage wheels shook her from her reverie, and the doors of the parsonage opened for the viewing, and the sale of their possessions commenced. As one by one their belongings made their exit in what was once their holding place, Jane fixed her eyes at her pianoforte once more as it was being transported, then looked away. Epilogue It is now the latter part of 1815. Reverend George Austen had long passed away. Jane Austen, Cassandra and their mamma have settled in Chawton Village. This afternoon we find Jane playing on the pianoforte. She paused and pondered on how music had graced her life very evidently, as reflected in her published books. Her heroines Emma Woodhouse, Marion Dashwood, Elizabeth Bennet and others played the pianoforte. 
With a faint smile, she continued playing the ivories. The instrument she currently possessed was handsome, true enough. But her heart still fondly remembers the first one she called her own. The pianoforte at Steventon Parsonage. End.